Hello and good morning. I'm just going to um, welcome you in informally before we kick off. We've got quite a big crowd today, which is just fantastic. Um, but it will take us a little while to get everyone in the room. So for those of you who are, um, have joined us and you're um, putting faces to names, um, you'll see that we actually have our wonderful researchers here and I'll introduce them shortly, but um, just a little bit more time. Thank you to those of you who have joined early so that we could get this process done very quickly. Joyce, I might just suggest you give me a sign when you think we're there, but I can still see that we've got lots of people entering. Okay. Joyce, are we good to go? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, a very um, warm welcome to everyone and thank you so much for taking the time to come and, and join us today to hear about Genderwise Investing, a springboard for Australia's recovery. Uh, this is a very important research report, one we're very proud of and one that's very timely. Um, I would like, of course, to begin by acknowledging that from where I am, I'm joining you uh, from Wurundjeri lands and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging from the Kulin Nation and all those um, elders and leaders around this Australia. Um, behind me, you'll see, uh, for those who know Melbourne, the MCG and in fact, um, Yarra Park, which is uh, uh, the original corroboree lands for people around here. Uh, it was a meeting place. One of the things I'm really conscious of is that we say these words at the beginning of every meeting and I'm trying to challenge myself more and more about what action I take as well as actually observing this really important protocol. So there's two things I wanna just um, point out. One is that I make a point of personally following Ronan Glynn and her Instagram account, Common Ground, which is a great educational piece. Um, but I also, we make sure we actively um, seek out and put up projects onto our online project showcase that support Indigenous women. And so we'll get to that a little bit more lately. Um, that's right, a bit uh, later in the, in the program. Um, so following a brief introduction from me, I'm going to hand directly to our researchers to share the findings of the report with you. Uh, and after 15 or 20 minutes of that, um, Catherine Fox, who will be well known to all of you, uh, will lead uh, a Q&A with Angela and Leonora, and they will we're really determined to leave um, at least 20 minutes to open that up for the group. So please think about your questions, put them in the chat as we go. If that's what you'd like to do, we'll be monitoring that. I'd encourage you all to stay on mute as is our normal protocol. And because we have nearly 200 people on this call, um, I want to just say there might be a point if it gets unstable, please just turn your video off. Um, I want to welcome particularly the men. We've done a call out to men to say we had, I think, 150 registrations a few days ago and 11 men. Um, we've built up to nearly 200 and a few more men. Um, but one of them I know, Jack Heath, is the new um, CEO of Philanthropy Australia, and I'm delighted, Jack, that you're joining us today. I think this is a message for a lot of men in philanthropy. Um, so at the end of this, we will officially um, launch our report and share that with you but we will finish at midday. Anyone who wants to stay on and have a chat with me, I'll make sure I'm here for that afterwards. Um, but we are recording today. So if you want to be anonymous, um, feel free to keep your video off and change your name. 
but I'm sure that anyone who's here is very out and proud about being focused on women and girls as a key driver in our recovery efforts. Um, I want to acknowledge our wonderful operations manager, Joyce, who's in Perth in hotel quarantine. And we've got some backup measures here because the hotel she's staying in doesn't have fantastic um, recording facilities. So thanks to the Australian Communities Foundation and to Madeline for helping us out this morning. So to introduce our expert economists and researchers today, um, Dr. Angela Jackson is the founder of Equity Economics and a leading voice for economic analysis. Uh, certainly I started following Angela on Twitter a while ago and have seen her recently as a star performer on ABC News. Uh, but increasingly, Angela's is a voice that people are looking to for particularly this gender lens analysis, but many other aspects of economic analysis. Um, you've seen both um, Leonora and Angela's bios. I'm not going to read through them. They're far too impressive and too long. Um, but thank you, Angela and Leonora, for being with us. Um, Leonora, I had had the pleasure of meeting in a couple of forums um, prior to this. Leonora is um, a, a lecturer in economics at RMIT University, but has a number of other titles, which you may have seen. Um, including um, being a fellow with the Women and Public Policy Program at Harvard University, and most recently appointed as a research fellow um, with the Women's Leadership Institute of Australia. And many of you joined us for the call last a uh, couple of weeks ago with Carol Schwartz as leading philanthropist. Uh, and Carol is the founder and funder of the Women's Leadership Institute of Australia. And um, in fact, our report today has been funded by the Erdi Foundation and the Beeson Family Foundation. And I really want to take a moment to thank all of our supporters and um, funders, but most particularly Beeson and Erdi for your fantastic support of this report. So one other thing to mention before I hand to Leonora, and that is that this report has a domestic focus. Uh, at Australians Investing in Women, we're particularly um, careful to uh, make sure that every dollar um, that's invested philanthropically, whether it's in Australia or internationally, has a gender lens. But in this case, whilst we acknowledge that the impacts are absolutely profound around the world, we're focused on Australia. So thank you very much for being here again. I'm going to warmly welcome Angela, Leonora and Catherine and to each of you and Leonora if I could hand to you to begin. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you Julie. It's a great pleasure for Angela and I to join you today. I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Ugamba people in southeast Queensland and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of these lands. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make our contribution by way of this research to the work and the goals of Australians investing in women and to help you connect even more strongly with the philanthropic community and those who share this common value of creating a more gender equitable society. And as Australia as a country is looking, for a, looking towards a path to recovery out of this pandemic, the timing for you to initiate this research, Julie, and to illustrate what is meant by gender-wise investing could not be more essential or more powerful. So even before the pandemic, we know there has been an awareness among some researchers and policy practitioners and advocacy groups of the importance of placing a gender lens on our economic analysis and policy making but it is not a mainstream approach or it is misunderstood and categorized as women's issues rather than being recognized for delivering widespread benefits across society. So gender lensing is about facilitating gender equity in all of our analysis and decision-making. And the COVID pandemic provides us with a striking opportunity to illustrate how gender lensing can be applied so this report is essentially a case study of how it can be done and why it is important. And we really value this opportunity to provide this analysis 
in the context of the way that private donors and philanthropic funding can make a difference through your investments, because we recognise there are many ways that this sector can complement existing forms of formal support and in many respects be even better placed to respond and drive change, especially at a community based level. So we would encourage the sector to embrace those strengths. Um, in this overview today, I'll start by expanding a little bit more about what gender lensing entails and then Angela is going to share with you some of our findings and the investment opportunities that have come out of that. And then along with Catherine, we'll look forward to answering your questions and opening it up for discussion. So to begin with, to provide a clearer idea about what do we mean by gender lensing, the research is very clear pre-pandemic that major shocks such as natural disasters, a disease outbreak, an economic crisis affects men and women differently. On average, we know that these differences arise because men and women tend to walk different pathways in life. They're employed in different industries. They take on different roles in the household, in community, in wider society. And so gender lensing is systematically looking at the specific ways that a crisis event or any type of economic shock has these different impacts on men and women. It's deliberate and systematic about it. And if we can understand how men and, different, men and women are differently affected, then it equips us to design better policy responses and responses that support and foster gender equity goals rather than potentially hinder it. There is a risk that by not casting a gender lens on our impact analysis, we come up with policy responses that are well-intentioned but can have inadvertent effects on certain cohorts of the population and in this case potentially an inadvertent effect on women. And we also need to point out that gender lensing is not just about women's particular or specific um, challenges and barriers. Gender lensing is about identifying those areas of need which are relatively higher amongst men too. And as one example to give you here in the context of the pandemic, there's research that shows that if you were just looking at working parents, it was actually working fathers more so than working mothers who experienced the greatest surge in psychological distress as a result of having to work at home. And so that is an example of gender lensing and understanding that men's experience of the world and their capacity to uh, be accustomed to working from home and looking after children is different on average from what women experience. We, we must also disaggregate our analysis, not just according to gender, but according to all the other important layers of disadvantage and discrimination that can unfold in society according to people's different socio-demographic uh, characteristics. So we would like to uh, particularly highlight how an analysis of these types of uh, economic crises can uh, highlight how these more vulnerable cohorts of society uh, tend to experience more severe outcomes, particularly women and girls from Indigenous communities, those with a disability from the LGBTIQ community, from migrant and refugee backgrounds, and from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and in remote areas. And so it's not just on the basis of gender, but applying this intersectional approach also allows us to understand and appreciate the diversity of experiences that exist within our population. And on that note, it's really important to understand the need for data to be disaggregated in that way as well. I'd also like to mention that we will be talking in terms of men and women. A lot of the data, most of the data is disaggregated and classified according to that binary classification. Of course, we absolutely acknowledge the many individuals who do not identify with that binary definition. When we analyze the data, we've identified areas of need 
part of the response entails immediately responding to those areas of need. For example, providing crisis support for women and girls and children uh, who are seeking uh, support in the context of domestic violence, for example. But a gender equity, equitable policy approach is not just about responding to need and crisis after the, the hurt has been incurred or the damage has been done. It's also about addressing the sources of bias and barriers that exist within our systems, within our culture, within our institutions to begin with. And so we would encourage uh, philanthropic donors to uh, apply, if you can, that longer term perspective. On one hand, part of, part of the approach is, does require that immediate assistance, that immediate provision of support. But it's also about understanding what gave rise to that outcome to begin with. Can we unwind? Can we go further back in the process and target the factors that gave rise to those uh, disturbing and unfair and damaging outcomes? And on that note, what are we talking about when we talk about that broader co cultural change? This is where it's incredibly important to invest in women's economic independence along the life course. That entails full participation in the, in the paid labour market, full opportunities for entrepreneurship that are offered on par with the opportunities that are offered to men and women's represent, representation in leadership, particularly amongst women from more diverse backgrounds than um, the narrow pool of um, of uh, demographic cohorts that many of our current leaders come from. Now, these ingredients are essential from an economist perspective, building economic prosperity, uh, thriving opportunities for the economy. But we would also argue that more fundamentally, this is a matter of values and gender equity is a matter of values. The business case it is a bonus, but this is also about understanding that this is a morals and principles based issue as well. So in our report, we identified uh, these, these five overarching areas and Angela is going to discuss the specific findings in more detail now. Just to um, give you that overview, we looked at employment opportunities, analyzing the data, it's very evidence-based, it's data research-based. To what extent did women experience a greater fallout in terms of economic implications from the pandemic um, relative to men. We looked at mental health, we looked at safety and domestic violence, and we looked at accessibility to secure and affordable housing. Complementing that, we also identified particular cohorts of women um, for whom their experiences um, of life had been severely disrupted by the pandemic. Uh, younger women, students, new mothers, uh, women's career advancement and older women. Some of these effects, when we apply a gender lens, we identify things that are not necessarily obvious or visible, or it's going to take a while for us to see the repercussions. The, the, um, the uh, fallout from the pandemic is not necessarily going to be obvious to begin with, but we are looking ahead to what the implications are in the future. One example here is with women's career advancement. What we are observing is that proportionally more women are taking up the option to, if they have, if they have been fortunate enough to retain their job, to work from home to, so that they can balance work and family more effectively. And it's disproportionately more men who are, and people without children who are taking up the option to return to the office, return to site. Now that brings many benefits in terms of at least it's enabling parents to be able to balance and maintain their uh, work responsibilities and their family responsibilities. But if we're not seeing that done in a, a gender balanced way and we have disproportionately more men returning to the office, we know from pre-existing research that that brings with it advantages in terms of networking, in terms of opportunities to be um, amongst your colleagues, to be fully informed in, in information, um, promotional opportunities that evolve from that. So that is just one example of how applying that gender lens and looking for gender 
um, bias patterns in the data and in people's behaviour and responses could lead to um, a threatening uh, progress on gender equity in the future. So I'll now turn over to, hand over to um, Angela to talk through some of the findings um, and then what opportunities for investment um, we identified from that. Keeping in mind, this is just a small handful of findings and the report um, expands upon it in, in more detail. So over to you, Angela. Well, thank you, Leonora, um, and thank you, Julie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, for what I hope is a, um, an insightful report, but one that gives people some hope in terms of where there are areas for action and where we can have real progress going forward. Um, so starting out, and this is an area that's obviously got a lot of attention over the last 12 months, um, this recession felt a lot different to other recessions, and there was a reason for that. Um, the COVID-19 recession impacted female jobs much more than previous recessions had because of the nature of lockdowns and the industries that affected. Um, women lost three out of every five jobs at the peak of the pandemic. Um, and we had women, obviously there was a rise in caring and domestic and housework as well. So women really brought the brunt at the peak of the pandemic. And we saw there was a focus, at least initially, that perhaps there needed to be a gender response. What we then saw happen, I think, uh, towards the end of last year was things started to even out a bit more. So it became more 50-50 and suddenly we didn't need a gender response. Now, that's clearly not the case. Um, you would think that if the impact was 50-50, then the response should be 50-50. We didn't see that, um, and what we're going to what we what we find in the report in particular, and we'll go to the next slide, Leonora, is around this long term impact of not addressing that gendered impact, um, because the disproportionate impact when we look at it in more detail was predominantly around young women. Um, so we saw job losses amongst that younger cohort being uh, much more heavily focused on younger women. Um, and those job losses actually in the older cohorts, there wasn't such a gender difference. Now, this is critical, obviously, for long term um, progress in terms of addressing gender equity. We already know, and, and the research goes to this, that entering the labour market uh, at periods of high unemployment leads to long-term scarring effects. And the reason for that is not just that people don't get jobs, but also their matching to good jobs um, is diminished if they enter the labour market in poor economic times. The fact that more young women lost jobs than more men um, when they're going back into work, they're probably not going back into as well matched jobs. And so their future earnings are gonna be impacted. So we need an immediate policy response in this space um, to ensure that those women who perhaps have gone back into work, but maybe lower skilled work, maybe jobs that don't necessarily match uh, their skills and, and are gonna produce longer term wages, that that can be addressed in the years ahead so that they can get back on that higher earning um, curve as we, we call it in economics um, we don't have the graph but what you can see is when you enter into employment at periods of high unemployment your long-term earnings curve is a lot lower than if you enter into periods where there is much lower unemployment and so these women face longer term impacts from this um, the impact on women with bachelor's degree in particular is, is really interesting I think and it sort of goes to a question about who was chosen for some of those redundancies at the peak of the pandemic. We know that younger people were more likely to be let go by firms, but was it also more women were let go at that period? Um, and are they back in full-time work or not? And Leonora will talk to this more, more uh, later in the presentation, but what we can see is also that the hours worked, that the underemployment among young women is much higher than, under young, than young men even today. Um, Next slide, sorry, Leanne, <laughs> I'm not driving. Um, then there are other domains, of course. So that's employment, which is critically important. But we know that gender equity is broader than just employment and it's broader than just you know, economic participation. So men in mental health, um, there are different impacts in terms of mental health already amongst younger women and younger men. So younger women are more likely to suffer poor mental health than younger men. We know that younger men obviously have or more likely to commit suicide and more likely to have extreme um, extreme mental health conditions. But in terms of that productivity impact of poor mental health, it falls more heavily on young women. And we saw that through the pandemic that worsened. So the impact on women was worse than the impact on men. Um, we also saw in terms of domestic violence, and it was interesting to go back on this, we 
at Equity Economics, we looked at this a lot last year and there wasn't the data, but now that the data has come out, we actually see there was an increase even in 1920 on in, in compared to the previous year across Australia and domestic violence and reports of domestic violence. Um, in order to do an Australian wine comparison, we had to do that 1920. But when you look again at some of the jurisdictions that have data that's more recent, that trend continued through the end of the year. So we had a lot of reports and survey data, but now we're seeing it in real data um, and that rates of domestic violence did increase during the pandemic. And that needs obviously an immediate response because that means more women are in a position uh, of being in immediate danger and are gonna need more crisis support um, to help them get out of that situation. Uh, sorry, next slide, Leonor. Um, the other area I think is around secure and affordable housing. It's obviously a hot topic at the moment. You know, the one side of rising house prices is obviously that also diminishes housing affordability. And that's a particular issue for women who are less likely to be homeowners um, and are more likely to enter retirement having to rent and rely on the pension and therefore experience ex ex poverty and retirement. Um, and it's an incredibly important part. It's sort of, I guess, where the the lack of gender equity through a woman's life really comes to fruition when we reach that retirement age. Um, and we see that in the statistics in the census where the fastest group of homeless people are, are older women in Australia um, and that that trend is going to continue unless we have some interventions specifically at that cohort. That said, we did see, and this is why the gender lens is important, is that we did actually see through the pandemic that it was a predominantly men rather than women seeking homelessness services, uh, that increase that we saw over the year, which is pretty significant for a year on year increase. Um, that, but that actually it was higher amongst men than women and particularly around uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, women and men in particular was a higher cohort seeking greater assistance during the period. And sorry, next. Um, the other important thing to understand, I guess, in terms of thinking about, well, where are the policies? Where's the best bang for the buck in terms of investing for the topic? Is there are key points in life um, in which people you know, need that extra support? And part of that is around younger women who experience, as we discussed, higher rates of risk and anxiety, that support, entering the workforce, making sure that they're getting jobs that are they're well matched to in terms of their skill. We know that Australian women are you know, achieving excellent results in terms of their education education, but that is not transferring in terms of their lifelong earnings and their participation in the workforce. Um, so that younger woman cohort is critical. Um, we saw also through the pandemic, quite interestingly, at the start, and we'll see more university student enrolments, but a great a bigger decline and an actually substantial decline in uh, women, particularly over 25 in university enrolments compared to men. So there is some risk to that educational attainment equity that we currently have. Um, the traditional caring roles, and uh, this is a big one, and this is perhaps not necessarily within the philanthropic realm directly other than with the advocacy, but around what are the policies that Australia needs to in, in, implement to even up those caring roles within the household. Um, things around paid parental leave, which we saw uh, reports today out of New South Wales, public service there is introducing 14 weeks for both parents, which are, is exactly the type of policies we need to be seeing. Um, and how that then feeds into also the unconscious biases associated with working from home. How do we change those social norms? Um, I know there is a rush for business to get people back into the workplace, but I think uh, I encourage everybody to continue this flexible working because it really does benefit gender equity. Um, it allows, um, sorry, it allows men and women to both participate equally um, in the workforce and allows those caring responsibilities at home to be more equally and evenly shared. Um, and new mothers, I think this is an area we haven't really focused on and um, both Lee and I are or Leonora and I are getting towards sort of the end of our, that, that period in our lives. But certainly for people and new mothers during this period, they have lacked that support and what that's going to necessarily mean for them re-engaging back in the workforce. Um, and I think there does need to be a greater focus on that from a policy perspective in this recovery period as well. Um, so what type of investments are critical right now? And we highlight a number of amazing programs. And I think the thing, uh, the most uh, interesting thing about this report for me was really understanding the breadth of programs that are out there in the nonprofit sector and what amazing work is going on. Um, and really it is not an exhaustive list by any means what's in the report. And I think there are more things on um, the, the website that you can go to and look to, but obviously there is an amazing work going on out there. 
The types of investments that we do need though, are really, I think around these good quality job matching programs are critical, particularly for young women. You know, we know, and this is where economic research really, I hope can get into policy. We know that young people entering the labor market during these periods, um, suffer you know up to 10 years but lifelong reduction in earnings and it is predominantly due to poor job matching um, so programs that are really aimed at that are critical and uh, doing that now rather than waiting is obviously far more advantageous and you'll get far more benefits mental health support um, I think perhaps it's all catching up with all of us this, is, this has been a really big year. It has been a really difficult year where people have been put under more stress than they've probably ever had to endure before, um, particularly frontline health workers uh, and social care workers who are dealing with more trauma um, and more stress than they ever have had to before. We really need to be ramping up mental health support, I think, and that has obviously a very important um, productivity benefits for the economy, but also just generally health benefits. Um, domestic violence, it is... Thankfully, you know, part of the national conversation at the moment and everybody and hopefully the summit that is upcoming will help address it um, and we'll have a new action plan nationally. Um, but there is still a real role, I think, for the nonprofit sector and for philanthropic support to provide those that support and to women so that they can leave those unsafe relationships um, and have secure housing um, and then employment opportunities, which are also critical in terms of addressing domestic violence. I mean, part of the um, uh, you know, there's a lot of research around, I know recently around, you know, women who earn more money are more likely to experience uh, more money than their partners are more likely to experience domestic violence. But actually the research generally shows that where there is greater gender equity, so where women's employment is higher, um, the rates of domestic violence go down. So it's also critical that for women in that situation, that they are given support in terms of employment um, and housing, um, and so that they can be financially and economically independent. Um, affordable housing solutions. I think um, I was reading the other day, the OECD report <laughs> on affordable housing from last year. And not only is Australia doing terribly now, and we're one of the worst in the world in terms of housing affordability, that is actually also critical in terms of obviously general equity, but also productivity growth. So if people are spending too much money on housing they don't have as much money to invest in other things like education like healthcare, and that affects the overall productivity of your economy the concerning thing for Australia going forward is it's going to get worse um, and so the percentage of people that are going to be able to afford a home is going to drop and the percentage of our incomes that we're going to have to spend on housing is going to go up so we do need policies now that start addressing this so that that trend and that it's not going to stop on its own you know, like house prices and affordable housing is not simply going to fix itself and go to equilibrium. This will continue to get worse until we have uh, new programs in place to uh, investment vehicles to fund affordable housing, particularly for uh, target groups like older women, but also more broadly, the policy landscape changes. Um, and then there are initiatives. It's a cultural change piece. It feels like in Australia at the moment that cultural change is happening uh, and women are, are sort of awakening up to what uh, this lack of gender equity means for them and whether COVID-19 has done that. Um, it feels a lot more broader, I think, this movement now than it has in the past. There's, I think, an acceptance in Australia today that women and men are not equal and that without change, we won't be. Um, but that is, you know, but there is more work to be done on that around, particularly across in different communities across Australia. Um, you know, today we talk to you as, you know, four white women who are very privileged um, and we need to think more broadly about how we change that cultural message um, to ensure gender equity going forward. Um, so, um, so, Angela, thank you so much. Um, Please keep going, sorry. No, no, that's fine. So as I said, we, we've highlighted a number of amazing initiatives in the report, but I really encourage you to go to the website and to have a look at the other opportunities for investment in this space. Um, you know, gender equity is, uh, I think, you know, it's a long-term goal. This is something we're going to have to work towards for a long period of time. At the moment, Australia is currently on track to achieve gender equity in around 270 years. Um, I would love to be able to say, let's see it in our lifetime, but that's still potentially, you know, hopefully another 50 years away. Um, 
but it is a journey um, and that journey means looking at every decision we make um, and making a good decision in terms of well how does this impact different groups and how can we ensure that we're on that pathway and how will it affect getting to that end goal which is you know gender equity in Australia. Thanks Angela just to uh, follow on and say a few um, closing remarks to tie it together um, this follows on from the theme of what Angela has just shared with you here. The opportunities for philanthropic um, contributions are, are, are so deep and broad, particularly when we look at what can be offered in that space to complement um, what is currently available from the government and other more formal systems of support. It's clear that for a lot of these initiatives, they, they have their origins from a community base. It's community oriented solutions that come from people knowing what their people need, the people around them need, and can potentially be intimidated or not be able to connect to those formal systems of funding and support. So there's scope there for philanthropy to provide opportunities that are more accessible, more flexible more manageable. One example is some initiatives of female-led businesses where the females don't call themselves entrepreneurs because they're not doing it for a for-profit sense. They're doing it to give back to their community. So that type of language could be disincentivizing for them. Uh, so I think that that's something for us to explore even more um, beyond what's currently available. Um, the second point there, there is scope there for, uh, for philanthropists to incentivize, to design ways of supporting and encouraging and incentivizing organizations to sustain that commitment to action on gender equality. And this comes in light of observations that have been made by people like Libby Lyons from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, who's identified that there is fatigue and there is a deprioritization within some organizations to maintain their commitment to gender equality and gender diversity goals or diversity initiatives all around. It's seen as a, a luxury rather than an essential um, ongoing commitment within, <clears throat> excuse me, within the organization. So there is potential there. Um, a lot of these initiatives are really about changing systems and changing government approaches. And that's where the role of um, advocacy groups uh, is incredibly important, particularly those that are uh, pushing for gender responsive budgeting. So basically a gender lens within government policy making as a way to uh, oh, more good. Gender, gender equitable outcomes. Um, those initi initiatives to lift women's representation and leadership and decision making are particularly criti critical. I think what we are observing within the federal government's response is the need for those women themselves to come from diverse backgrounds and bring a diversity of um, life experiences. Uh, so there is scope for, uh, and for men from diverse backgrounds to be part of that leadership and decision making space as well. And then so much of this, when you peel away the layers, it does come back to ingrained gender stereotypes and unconscious biases um, that limit and potentially harm both men and women. In the report, we also look at research associated with the natural, natural disasters, for example, the bushfires and the prevalence of a gender stereotype within some parts of Australian society that condition men to think that they need to be brave and heroic in the face of danger. And that can lead to fatal consequences. Whereas uh, research showing the research shows that it was women, for instance, in the face of bushfires, who who wanted to um, to uh, flee flee the scene to escape rather than stay and defend their their um, their house in, the, um, in uh, with the fire approaching. So that is an example of how certain um, heroic or um, certain stereotypes that are attached to masculinity in Australia can have damaging effects also on men's mental health. And so we've got some references in the report that point towards those initiatives, which will ultimately serve for the well-being and safety and health of women and their children as well. Um, so I think we've covered all we can uh, and we've gone a bit over time, but over to you, Catherine, to um, take us through some questions and discussion, including with the audience. 
Um, Laura, thank you. Just before we do that, um, do you mind if I jump in just to um, congratulate both of you so much, not just on the report, but on the very succinct um, summary and sharing of those findings. Um, certainly, um, people will see why you are so perfect for this choice, but um, I want to highlight also the advocacy piece that you talk about is so important. And in the report, we talk about um, a report measure for measure, gender equality, uh, inequality in Australia that's been produced by per capita. And uh, it's one of the things that will really help guide our work also. So um, I think we're building a very good body of evidence here and we thank you very much. Um, I wanted just to quickly pay respect to Catherine, um, who I've assumed in a way is so well known, um, certainly to most of the people in our community, they've seen Catherine step up and take the lead in these conversations so adeptly. And we're very grateful to you, Catherine, for doing that. But for those who are new um, to our organisation, Catherine's our board director. She's a Walkley Award-winning journalist, as you would have seen. And she, this is actually her absolute sweet spot in the heartland. She knows this stuff in her bones. And I have um, learned so much just by reading um, books like uh, The Seven Myths of Merit and work. I hope I've got that right, Catherine. Um, and I want to send anyone who's anti-quotas. But uh, for now, I will hand over to you to ask some questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Julie, and for all the work you do. And I have to just add that um, when we briefed Angela and uh, Leonora, um, they very stoically took a deep breath when we mentioned a, a rather unattainable deadline for this research. So thank you so much. You did, uh, did a fantastic job. And as always, and any journalist will tell you, timing uh, is everything. And I just think that, um, as we've already referenced, this is a particular uh, moment that, that we seize um, and try and add momentum to, um, at the risk of, of um, rather depressing you with some of this data. But it really is a time where we can we can tr really move and change some of the uh, of the outcomes we, we sincerely hope. I wanted to just quickly ask you a couple of questions, and I know we've got a few coming in. You know, if you're reading uh, reports over the last few weeks, you'd almost be forgiven, and some of them, of course, quoting uh, very distinguished economists, for thinking, we've kind of, we're on the road to recovery. Actually, it wasn't quite as bad as some of the forecasting. Things are getting back to normal. Why has gender lensing, and maybe there's a couple of examples that you can use, you've referenced, how a gender lens has brought out a very different picture. So um, it's not as though you're working off completely different data, but you are drilling down into it. And I'd be just interested in a couple of examples to make that point about how important it is to put that gender lens over this information. Sure, well, Catherine, to begin with, those high headline numbers for the labour market, um, the unemployment rate, uh, the labour force participation rate look really promising and you're exactly right that we need um, other metrics and we need to disaggregate by gender to get a better picture. Uh, a dynamic that has occurred in the labour market is that women were more likely to step out of the workforce. So we saw that by way of a decrease in the labour force participation rate amongst women. And even though women are coming back into the workforce now, they're not going to be going back into the exact role that they had previously. And also, even though they might have a job, they are not getting as many hours as they would like. So if we look at the underemployment rate, men compared to women, women's underemployment rate is actually higher. So even though the data looks like they have a job, they are requesting or seeking more hours than they're currently um, uh, being given. And we see that across various industries. So that is an example of the persistence of some sort of gender patterned uh, differential in the labour market. We also want to keep in mind that we have not yet seen the effect of the withdrawal of the job um, keeper support payments. And so we are still going to see some adjustment in the labor market. That's one example. And Angela, I think can share a little bit more about um, the scarring effect, which was gender patterns as well. Yeah, that's right. So we know um, actually in previous recessions that that scarring effect is actually worse for women anyway than for men. So um, only marginally, but it is worse. So the, the long-term effects on female wages, are, it's, it's longer than for male wages entering into the labour market during an economic recession. And we also know that because this has impacted young women so much more than young men, that those 
those impacts don't just go away even if you get back into a job as we said the job matching and it's what jobs people have gone into and um, you know maybe they were previously in a professional job and now they're doing hospitality or even if the job isn't quite matching to their skill set and, and to um, then they will suffer long-term earning loss and productivity loss as a result of that. So yes, the recovery has been a lot better than we thought. Uh, I think there's still a way to go though. So the bounce back has been huge, but we've got to remember that the scale of economic stimulus that was flowing through the economy. I think often a lot of economists, and we have been surprised to be honest with you, it, it has been a lot stronger than people thought. But if you sit back and you go, yeah, well, they did, you know, the stimulus was around 10% of GDP. <laughs> it was like, phenomenal um, level of economic stimulus, um, maybe it's not that surprising that the economy has come back, but that stimulus is now coming off. Um, we are still going to have border closures for another 12 months. These problems are not going to go away in terms of the economic impacts. And even broader than job losses, we know that in terms of things around housing stress, things around domestic violence and mental health, higher rates of unemployment are going to impact women more than men. Um, on those broader sort of metrics outside of just employment. So I think we're in a positive position in Australia and I think we should be very you know, thankful, obviously, that we managed to control the pandemic as well as we did and we're seeing the economic benefits. But I think the failures, particularly around vaccination rollouts, um, are going to bite a lot harder than perhaps we're anticipating at the moment. I think we're in a bit of a... Um, I don't want to say la la land, but I think we're still sort of all enjoying, you know, the, the transfer of wealth from the public sector to the private sector last year was unprecedented. Um, and we saw that, you know, in terms of businesses, but also individuals and people are enjoying that feeling and that transfer of wealth and that increased wealth. But if incomes don't continue, um, you know, to grow, then behaviour will change pretty quickly and the economic situation could change pretty quickly. So, yes, it's good, but I think we don't want to, you know, misread exactly how good it is. Just uh, just quickly on that, um, occupational segregation always been an issue in this country, very, very high level of it, one of the highest in the OECD. Is that likely to just become more concentrated after this? I mean, it just strikes me um, with, with all of these factors, will women end up, you know, clustering even more so in, into certain sectors or uh, hopefully, of course, we'd love to see uh, philanthropy and donors step step up now around that whole reskilling job matching area, but that that would actually prevent that, wouldn't it, if it, if it was a risk. Yeah, so part of the gender segregation story comes from the really high concentration of women in healthcare and social assistance and education and training. I don't think there are any indications at the moment that there are more men gravitating towards those fields, for instance. So I don't think there's any um, signs on the horizon that gender segregation is going to, uh, um, by, by way of industry, is going to improve. I think also we need to look at gender segregation in a vertical sense. So that concentration of, of managers, um, executives, senior roles um, relative to um, who's at the lower ends or more junior rates, I think the signs are that that will worsen because of a lot of the factors that we've described. I think combining what Angela has just said about you know, this recovery path, one way to visualise it is like a K shape. You may have if you heard about the V-shaped recovery and all these different letters of the alphabet, one way to conceptualise it is a, a K. So partly a, a big chunk of the economy and the workforce is recovering, but some people are bottoming out. And so when we look at um, how do we get back on track to where things were, we are really concerned about um, our women disproportionately in that bottom bottom of the K and, and bottoming out of the recovery. And so I think a lot of the emphasis is on getting women into those higher paid jobs or those higher earning occupations. Is that a way to, um, to uh, break down that current gender segregation that we see across industries? But unless, I mean, someone still has to work in those caring roles and in those um, critically important roles of um, healthcare, social, community support. So just by assuming that women or hypothesizing that women are going to move into the higher earning roles, that's not, that's not a solution there. And I think one of the issues is the very flat um, pay gradient within those industries. Um, and so there's a whole, whole suite of other issues, I think, that would go towards uh, rewarding and recognizing those industries as being incredibly important. And that's where you might then see potentially more men gravitate towards that and also changing those gender norms about 
men just as much as women being in caring roles in, in the paid workforce and, and at home. Yeah breaking that down yeah and just quickly before I, we open I'll up. just jump in because I think that caring is an interesting one like we do see a, a lot of programs aimed at getting girls into engineering and girls into you know entrepreneurial roles but actually to address the caring workforce um, demands of the next you know 20 to 30 years we're going to need a lot more workers and we're going to need men to work in those be prepared to go and work in those sectors um, and we see internationally a lot of effort going towards attracting more men so it's actually around you know we talk about gender equity in terms of promoting women it's actually about promoting men in those careers um, and again when we apply sort of the gender lens but also the socioeconomic lens we know that you know for lower educated men um, in particular these jobs are actually quite good jobs um, and might be a really secure way into employment so I think you know when we're looking at the gender lens looking at uh, how we invest money investing in things that do promote the health and social care sector and those caring roles um, to men as well as a career option is also really important and that will help gender equity more broadly um, but also shows you the importance of having that gender lens but there do, do need to be different approaches and different policy responses. That's right. Um, on gender responsive um, budgeting I mean one of the, the crucial um, steps towards that of course is, is data is gathering um, data uh, disaggregating. Where can philanthropists uh, and people running programs and people with us today where can they play a role in that? Well, that's exactly right, Catherine, that data collection, not just on the basis of gender, but through an intersectional lens within gender is absolutely critical. And a lot of the time, that's the first hurdle, not being able to analyse the impact because the data doesn't exist. So I think there is lots of opportunities there for, it's often a resource constraint. It is it's funding and it's capacity building. So building people's understanding of the importance of the issue, that's where advocacy comes into it, then skilling people with the technical expertise to be able to do that. As a trained economist, we don't get taught this. We, we discover it later in life how important it is and that we didn't get taught that in our in our econometric classes. So it's something that I think um, is part of the policy practitioner space. And I know that there are some state governments that are really um, ahead of the game on this and are looking into that. Um, not all state governments and to our knowledge, not really at the current federal government. So it is about, um, I think, supporting advocacy efforts and those advocacy groups are also highly tuned in to the need for training and capacity building uh, within the public uh, policy practitioners and analysts who will be the ones who are ultimately implementing that. Absolutely. Now, Julie, I know we had a few uh, comments and questions coming in. Shall we, um, shall we open up and, and address some of them? Yes, please. And um, there's certainly one that to asks uh, of the sectors that we've identified, is there a different return on investment? There's a question about if we looked at this purely through an Indigenous lens, are there specific things? There's a number. Um, I, I would love you actually to start with, I think it's an extension of the question about data. It's very difficult for us to talk about return on investment and be able to analyse anything, particularly in philanthropy, until we have a better system for recording investment outcomes um, and looking at that by gender. Um, but Catherine, feel free to choose one from the chat um, and um, pick that up. But I, I think... Um, yeah, well, there were a number that also uh, referenced the fact that we do still, even though we've fallen down on the, um, the global gender gap index quite notoriously and recently, uh, that we still rank number one in the world for education, uh, equal number one in the world for education of women and girls. And yet this, this awful discrepancy then opens up uh, where we see we fall down on a number of other measures. Um, this is something that I've been speaking about for years. I mean, it just is such a poor return on investment. Um, and this, again, is, is a call out, isn't it, to say with those horrifying numbers of young women with university degrees uh, unemployed. Um, and I guess just I'd be asking both of you, the long term effect, and Angela, you mentioned scarring. Goodness, the long term effect of that uh, on our economy um, is just is, it's pretty frightening, actually, to contemplate, isn't it, if we don't do something now? Yeah, no, look, I think that's definitely the case. And the, the thing around gender equity, I guess, from an economic perspective is that it's actually really good for the economy. So uh, I think the Prime Minister last year said, look, I'm happy for women to be equal as long as, you know, no one else is brought down. But the, the reality is that 
we do invest in women and we educationally we are ready and we're ready to be productive but the society structures in Australia um, whether it's unconscious bias and also the way in which caring roles continue to be um, shared between men and women and a number of other factors mean that we're not using it right and so we're losing economic growth um, and this should be seen as the great growth story and great growth opportunity I think of the next 20 to 30 years alongside climate change is achieving gender equity can really drive economic growth and lift living standards um, and so I, I don't want to just say that that's the only reason it's important because it's not I think that there is just a fundamental issue at bay which is we want our you know we want men and women to be equal and we, and we believe that women have a right to that equality and that our society isn't delivering at the moment I think that's why Australian women are so angry at the moment is that realization that it's just not delivering right now, but it's also an economic argument. And, and so I think understanding that um, and pursuing both those angles, I think is important in terms of changing the minds of the treasuries and the finance departments. Um, but we should never lose sight of the fact that gender equity in itself needs to be the target and um, nor apologize for it, to be honest with you. I think sometimes, and I know there is fatigue out there and I know, you know, people don't like women standing up, you know, and saying, well, I am equal, et cetera. And why are there only, you know, we recently had a, um, incredibly disappointing a uh, you know a national debate around the rba and the future of the rba where 13 male economists were quoted um, and it wasn't until there was a criticism where one female economist was quoted um, and they were all white male economists so we still have this real um issue in australia or uh, an inability to see that gender in inequity at play and what the impacts that then has um, so I'm sorry, I've gone off on, I feel like a, a rant there in terms of, but I think that placing gender equity in terms of a, an economic narrative is really important, but we shouldn't also lose sight of the fact that it is important in of itself. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, Catherine, I can say a few words quickly about you. Know, how do we how do we quantify or measure, identify these returns when they are often way out into the distance? Um, and it's very hard to um, justify that upfront investment. And this is a problem that plagues um, uh, government as well, because they talk about, say, investing more in childcare on their, they're focusing on their commitment to this recurring expense rather than identifying the recurring benefit that comes from that. So they focus just on one side of the ledger. There's, is work, there is econometric modelling by people like Janine Dixon from Victoria University, and it's published in the National Foundation for Australian Women's. Um, they're voluntary produced, voluntarily produced um, report on the gender lens on the annual budget. And it does show that if you expand the government provision of aged care, childcare, disability care to meet that unmet demand that would free up more people to be able to enter the paid labor market, be better matched to their skills, it does generate a benefit to the economy by way of people paying more income tax, um, and then freeing them up to actually uh, earn, earn more income, be more self-sufficient. And so the, the data is out there and I think we can apply it to that um, private investment space as well. What I would also add is that we can choose which metrics matter for us. So the government has said, oh, we're looking at uh, women's labor force participation rate, for instance, and that's increasing or the gender pay gap. We know there are so many other metrics that really matter. For instance, what share of men are taking up paid parental leave and spending time at home? We can highlight, we can choose our dashboard of metrics that we know matter and organizations can do that they can state their commitment to the metrics that they know will dig deeper and be more meaningful the comments exactly right that we we celebrate women's um, educational attainment it's been a long time in over history that women have exceeded men on average in terms of university qualifications and the fact that that has not translated into parity in the workforce speaks to the biases that exist in the workforce. It's not a capability deficit. It's a bias in this system. Um, so I think we can highlight the, the metrics that matter. One of them is not necessarily achieving 50-50 as an outcome, but it's are we seeing the absence, the eradication of those systemic biases? For instance, measuring how long does it take for a woman to reach a senior management role compared to how long it takes a man. There are far more nuances that we can um, draw attention to. Yeah. 
Leonora, I'm going to jump in there and ask if you wouldn't mind uh, returning to the slides. And, and thank you, Catherine, very much for leading that conversation. Um, I promised that we'd finish by midday. And as you can see, there is so much to say and so much to share that um, I've broken that promise. So I do apologize. I want to just very quickly talk about moving into action. And there was a comment from John King. Thank you. Um, in the chat saying, well, how many philanthropists aren't intentionally and actively and deliberately applying a gender lens? Uh, and what can we do to change that? So that is actually why we exist and we need all of you in the sector to actually help us with that ambition. Um, the report link is in your chat, um, but we've also updated and um, sh we'll share with you our new resources. So we have a new guide to gender-wise philanthropy and uh, a new toolkit. And the toolkit is really the key. Just uh, look at that and see how that um, can improve your grant making uh, and also your data collection. So, um, it's a big ad, go to our website. I think I want to make one really clear point about the case studies that are in this fantastic report. They are examples. They are not the be all and end all. They're excellent projects. We want you to consider them, but they are there to make an illustration of here is the problem, here's the solution, and here's some examples of what you might do. Um, so please go to our online project showcase. If you're a not-for-profit and your project is not up there for display, please submit one. Um, and um, we're here to actually really support this process. So thank you, Leonor. Could you just move to the next slide, which is really an important um, to the philanthropic sector that supports our work. Um, I look at them and think these are the progressive funders and, we, and those funders who really understand and have been in the game a long time and know about impact, so thank you. And thank you to Erdi and Beeson again. And just finally, given um, the content of the report and some of the discussions, we do just want to remind people that um, if this discussion has raised any issues for you, there is support available. And um, I know that some of these domestic violence figures in particular are quite confronting and the mental health issues. Um, so perhaps, Leonor, if you go back to our resources file, I'm going to say, slide, I'm going to say thank you again to our wonderful researchers, to you, Catherine, for your incredible commitment to this work and um, all of the, the time and effort you put into supporting us. Um, but mostly thank you to everyone who's made this a priority and come along. If you have burning questions, I'm happy to stay on. Um, but otherwise, we will be sending you out the recording and the resources um, very shortly. So thank you.